So last year when I started working on this, uh, I was asked to do a sort of promotional video for the typeface, and I coined this phrase to describe Helvetica. It was pompous, um, sort of ridiculous. There is no typeface for everyone, everywhere, for everything. But if one typeface could do that, it's Helvetica now. Um, it's Helvetica. I mean, it's the typeface that is, without hyperbole, the most famous typeface in the history of the world. Um, <laughs> ever. <laughs> so the question is, from type designers mostly, why are you doing this? Um, <laughs> graphic designers are like, please, do it. Um, but type designers ask why. Like, why, why in the world did you have to redo Helvetica? There are, I have three simple reasons why. The first is that, I like that little hand. I can't move that hand. There it goes. Uh, look at that. It's gigantic. Um, those are beautiful figures. Um, the first is that, it had been 35 years since Helvetica was made digital or for PostScript the first time, which is an eternity. It's forever. I mean, 35 years ago, I mean, to me, it's not that long, but for a typeface, it's forever. Um, 35 years ago, there was no internet in our lives. 35 years ago, we didn't have email addresses. Some people did. There are probably more people in this locale than elsewhere, but most of us, mortals, didn't have email addresses or access to a, an internet. Um, 35 years is forever. A lot has changed since then. The second reason is that when Helvetica was digitized in 1982 for PostScript, 1982, it was digitized as a single master uh, design. So that master was meant to be used in 10 to 12 point type not 72-point type, not six-point type, but one uh, range of type for text. But you and I have used Helvetica, Neue Helvetica from 1982. Uh, we've used it gigantically. We've used it really, really small. Um, and sometimes to good effect, but sometimes not so great. The third reason that we made Helvetica now is that in the intervening 35-plus years, uh, We've learned a lot from the way that people were using Neue Helvetica. We learned about how they used it when it was really large, what was necessary. In fact, in college, I learned how to make something like Neue Helvetica work in really large sizes by physically changing the typeface, um, cutting pieces off of it, slamming them together, spacing it much tighter. It was a kind of uh, sort of psycho-religion in design school altering Helvetica in order to make it work at large sizes. Um, and we didn't use it in small sizes, not Neue Helvetica, because it was meant for 10 point, and if you shrunk it down to six point, uh, the forms closed up, the spacing was too tight, and all, all in all, it was not a really good fit for that. So we've taken some, a lot of those lessons that we learned from our customers and worked them into the new Helvetica now. So what did we do? Um, we did some really obvious things and some not so obvious things. The first, the most obvious thing is that we've added these alternate forms. So these are forms, like you can see from the vitrines in the back where the, um, the mini exhibition is held. Um, there are forms like uh, this straight-legged R, which existed in the typeface a long time ago, but when it became Neue Helvetica, they got stripped out. Um, there's a single story A, which gives it a sort of fundamental, sort of uh, uh, almost uh, primary look, um, more Futura-like, which seems like it's purely stylistic, but a lot of our publishing partners actually require a single story A for publishing children's literature, so it's sort of not only stylish, but helpful. Um, almost every other custom uh, or modified version of Helvetica we do is one where people ask us to take the punctuation and the jots and make them circular. It's just like everybody's favorite idea <laughs> for modifying a typeface. Um, the I and the L, the capital I and the lowercase L in Helvetica, in Neue Helvetica, 
are practically the same, especially when you're down at six point. So having this little hooked L is really important for uh, disambiguating capital I and lowercase l at small sizes. Um, the G is just Futura-esque. It's a stylistic change. <laughs> As is the U without the trailing serif and the, um, the Y with the straight descender. And this sort of cruciform T, also very geometric looking, more uh, Futura-like. This is the part that's most important to me. I'm a type designer. Um, adding optical sizes back into this typeface gives it a kind of life that it hasn't had since it was photo digital. So in more than 35 years, Helvetica has not looked as good as it possibly could. Um, because when I was a little kid, Helvetica for photo and photo digital had optical sizes. Um, Helvetica for metal had optical sizes. There was a different drawing for little tiny sizes than there was for text and there was for display. The display is ready for its close-up. It's super, super detailed. Uh, its space is tighter. The forms are much more refined. Text is still sort of like rugged, um, lower contrast than the display. Um, but it's the Helvetica we know and love from Neue Helvetica. And the micro is like an impressionist painting of Helvetica, um, like a pointillist uh, painting. Like, it, at this scale, it looks kind of oafish. I mean, I love it, but mostly because I'm right here next to it. Um, and, I, and I designed that letter, so I better like it. Um, but when it gets small, it looks like Helvetica. But it looks like Helvetica that's much more legible than Helvetica has been in 40 years. So uh, the most important thing, sort of buried lead, it's not the sexiest thing. The alternates are the sexiest thing, but um, optical sizes are really important. Then we added more, more stuff, as the slide says. Uh, these Helvetica arrows have always sort of had a, a, co a coexistence with Helvetica. They were a big part of the international style adaptation of Helvetica early on in the 60s and 70s. Um, they're important for wayfinding and information graphics. And now they're baked into all of the weights and sizes of Helvetica now. As are these. So circled and squared uh, figures, super helpful if you're doing wayfinding, information design, information graphics. And they exist in the font. Um, as do these things, which weren't around in 1982. No Bitcoin in 82. Um, <laughs> And yeah, other currencies have come to the fore that just weren't on the radar in 1982. And in the display range, we've added this hairline, which is lovely, <laughs> um, and the super fat uh, extra black. So we've augmented the range. Uh, when I say when, I mean when. <laughs> when did this happen? Uh, it happened back in 1957. Now, this is a patron saint of, uh, of Helvetica, Max Meetinger. Um, this is pretty coeval, I think, this photo, with his, uh, with his actually designing Helvetica. So around circa 1957, um, in a little town called Münchenstein in Switzerland, um, Max was not operating on his own. He was hired as a former representative of the Haas foundry by uh, Edward Hoffman. So Edward Hoffman was the one who was looking, as the director of the Haas Foundry, looking across the, uh, the available uh, sans serif offerings from the first half of the 20th century and thought, this, we could do something better here. This is a real mess. Um, and he knew uh, Max Meetinger because Max had been a representative at the Haas Foundry earlier, but left to become a freelance graphic designer. So he hired him back in to draw Helvetica. Um, this is kind of one of the, it's sort of kind of the typefaces that existed prior to Helvetica. Now, to 21st century audiences, people are comfortable with seeing hundreds of thousands of typefaces in the course of a year. This looks really charming. I mean, normal. It's got weird things like um, flat sides on some of the letters, like a real rounded D here, but for some reason, like flat there. 
A lot of little idiosyncrasies build into it. But it's coming from a place where uh, there was no Helvetica. It comes from a time when the idea of a sans-serif family was being developed. Um, and what needed to happen, in Hoffman's eyes, was that this needed to be regularized. We needed to get rid of all the idiosyncrasies. We needed a typeface that reflected the ideals of Swiss modernism, clarity, simplicity, and neutrality. And so he got, uh, he got Max Meetinger involved to iron out all the idios idiosyncrasies. And they did it here in these charming little buildings in Munchenstein um, that were the Haas foundry. This is the typeface that they came up with. It's not called Helvetica. It's called Haas Grotesque. Um, and this was the original weight, the most beautiful weight of Helvetica. Um, nobody wants to fight me on that. Uh, <clears throat> it's the weight of Helvetica where the form and the counter are in this locked embrace. It's just, it's beautiful in terms of its balance of figure and ground. It's a study. Um, but it's not called Helvetica, it's called Haas Grotesque, or the new Neue Haas Grotesque, the new Haas Grotesque. Um, it was for hand typesetting, the kind of typesetting my dad did when he was a child, a child, young man. Um, one letter at a time, in reverse, into a composing stick, transfer to the bed of a press, print it up, decompose, start again. Uh, and nonetheless, Haas made a great show of this Neue Haas grotesque. Um, they took it to trade shows. You can see it here, actually, up around the top. They were selling it. It was being adopted as the new face of uh, mid-century modernism. There's Mr. Hoffman hanging out with his tie on in the middle of the showroom floor. Um, and yeah, they're doing demonstrations of punch cutting. There's some artifacts there. But you, it's the middle of the century. It's almost 1960. If you're going to have a typeface take over the world, if it's going to become the most famous typeface of all time, you better get cracking. Um, you can't be setting it one letter at a time. So they knew in order for this thing to take off, they needed to join forces with a machine typesetting company. So Haas was actually partly owned by Stempel, which eventually became owned by Linotype. Um, and in this... Uh, letter uh, from Han, Heinz Uhl to, um, to the other members of Stempel. He recommends for the first time that prior to turning this into a machine typesetting typeface, they changed the name to Helvetia, Switzerland. Um, only to find out later that Helvetia was already in use by a sewing machine company. And so instead of being Switzerland, the typeface became the Swiss. Helvetica. Um, Hoffman didn't like this. Uh, the director of the Haas foundry liked Neue Haas Grotesque better. And so for two or three years of its life, it existed in a bifurcated state where for hand typesetting, it was Neue Haas Grotesque. And for machine typesetting, it was Helvetica. Um, and then eventually, like the Burgermeister, um, people forgot about the Neue Haas Grotesque moniker, and Helvetica took over the world. This is Hoffman's notebook about the development of the typeface. You can see from the asterisk that he'd rather, <laughs> he's not really comfortable with the name Helvetica still. Um, but it's full of uh, beautiful things. And if you're looking really closely, um, some sort of uh, things that just got ironed out as time went on that are that we brought back, actually. Um, but lots of tests in here to get things just right. It's really hard to iron out all of the personality from a typeface. So this is the ironing board. Um, this is the back and forth between Hoffman and Meetinger, uh, getting this thing just right. But they weren't alone. At the same time, Adrian Frutiger was designing, it might be sacrilege to say, and this, I'm hoping this is, this is being recorded, so I'll say it anyways. Um, <laughs> Universe is a better typeface. <laughs> it's better designed. The details are much more neutral. Um, it came out of the box like this. So not the one weight. 
uh, but a preconceived notion of a perfect family of typefaces all orchestrated around a central design principle. And at the same time, the Berthold Foundry was taking their 50-plus-year-old typeface Exidens Grotesque, retooling it a little bit, and putting it out as standard for the British audience and for the American audience. So these were done at the same time as Helvetica, but somehow, I mean, these are great typefaces and they're very popular, but they're not Helvetica. How did Helvetica become this thing? Like the typeface of every company in the world for a good long time. Um, how did it come to represent the idea of modernism in type? Well, it had something to do with this. This is Helvetica for uh, phototype. And this, this is Helvetica digital. Nice floppy. That's like a floppy like you ain't seen a floppy. Um, <laughs> this is a, yeah, that's our old stuff. Um, and this. So every time, I mean, Helvetica was popular. It was popular when it became a machine setting typeface. Already popular. When it became uh, a photo typeface, it was first in line because it was already popular. When it became a photo digital typeface, it was the first in line because it was already popular. When this thing came around, actually not this, it was the, uh, the SE that came out before this, but these were the workhorses, the, the 2CI and the FX. Um, when these Macintoshes came out, Helvetica was in them, Helvetica was in every printer that was attached to them, um, and we all had Helvetica. It wasn't something that I was specking for type anymore. I wasn't going to a typesetter and asking for Helvetica. Helvetica lived in my house. It's insane. I mean, to me, it's insane. I'm a type author. <laughs> I might be insane. Um, so I told you who made Helvetica, um, but who made Helvetica now? This is the, the crew at Monotype responsible for Helvetica now. Um, now, I sit in all of these lists just because <laughs> there's nothing I love more than a good meeting. Um, but the, there are two names that I would like to, uh, to call out, Otmar Hoffer and Eric Speakerman. Not because they had the most to do with it, but I love those guys. You do too. Um, right? <laughs> that guy knows what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> they were, um, these two were not only involved as project originators for Helvetica Now back in 2014, but Otmar Hoffer was the project manager for Neue Helvetica in 1982. And Eric Speakerman was a consultant on this project, was also a consultant on Hel Neue Helvetica in 1982, and designed all the collateral uh, advertising material for Neue Helvetica in 82. So I didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago, which, but it blew my mind. Um, but you know, a full team of designers, and again, I should point out that uh, Jan Hendrik Weber um, took the concept that was developed by these project originators and gave it skin. Um, he made the first prototypical designs for Helvetica Now, like gave form to what these guys were saying needed to be in the ne next version of Helvetica. The rest of us drove cross country. We did <laughs> put our nose down and did the work. Um, but it's a huge group of people, six dozen people who, six dozen, five dozen, um, who took this from concept to fruition in five years. But who made Helvetica famous? There are, I'd say, a dozen philosophies of Helvetica. The first were the modernists, so um, people like Massimo Vignelli, um, who saw in Helvetica a typeface that carried no meaning, that let the meaning of the words carry the day. Um, so it became the typeface for him for the rest of his life. From the first time he saw it, he described it as the typeface that he wanted for everything. That's Massimo. That's my map. <laughs> uh, you can't see it, but his signature is down here. Um, and this is that map. Uh, and you can see in the vitrines in the back that uh, there's this sort of complex history of Helvetica and the New York City subway system. But this map that never got used um, does employ Helvetica throughout. It, can, it also employs accidents, grotesque, or standard. There's a mixture of typefaces in here. 
um, but they were using what they had available at the time. Um, and this is about as Swiss as any piece of design ever gets. So Swiss. So Joseph Muller Brockman writing a book about Swiss grid systems in red, white, and black using Helvetica. It's just it's so Swiss. Um, after the modernists, um, not directly after, but I would say as soon as the Macintosh gave Helvetica to everyone, modernists, um, modernism in graphic design became sort of easy. The rectilinear aspect of layout in the Macintosh made uh, modernism sort of second nature. The expressionists were using the tools that they had uh, to express that human beings were still involved in design. Um, and here, Helvetica becomes a, a paintbrush or paint. Um, it becomes an expressive medium um, that is not about modernism, but is about uh, showing emotion, showing humanity. Then, of course, there are the postmodernists, like Experimental Jet Set. Um, so this typeface, I mean, Experimental Jet Set, if you don't know them, you should, you should look them up. They only use Helvetica. Not my best friends, but they could be my best friends. Um, I think they're my best friends. They don't think so. Um, <clears throat> the, but this T-shirt that they designed, uh, it became the typographic meme of the early 21st century. Um, I mean, everyone has some variation on this theme. Um, this is not a variation on this theme. <laughs> this, is, this is my son's um, uh, T-shirt from when he was two. One. I, uh, I, I retouched it so there's no stains on it. Um, <laughs> but I can't bear to get rid of it. Um, the defaultists, these people made Helvetica famous. Uh, <laughs> why are you using Helvetica? Well, because it's on every computer in the world. Like, why wouldn't I use it? The accidentalists, these people I love. Like, the, I need some letters or numbers in this case. Just get, just get me some numbers. I need a one, a two, and a three. Helvetica? Whatever. It's accidental. Or this one. I need some signs for my restaurant. I like this. This, Carl, we need... Sh when, when we do... <laughs> when we do... <laughs> when we do Helvetica now, 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 um, we have to build that in as an alternate. It's beautiful. It's so big, too. <laughs> These people, you wouldn't think have made Helvetica famous, but um, like these, none of these are Helvetica, right? They're all Helvetica, but they're not Helvetica. They're typefaces that are like Helvetica. Um, they're even, some of them, openly copying Helvetica. There's one in here called Helios, which is a direct copy of Helvetica. Um, but it's when you see things that are almost like Helvetica that you really appreciate the genuine article. So in a lot of ways, these cheap knockoffs are driving people towards Helvetica, um, strangely enough. And then, yes. You can't be around for 65 years and be the most famous typeface ever in the history of the world and not uh, get people uh, tattooing Helvetica on their forearms or their tramp stamps on the back of their I have none of them that you know of. Um, but Helvetica is the only typeface that has a full-length documentary film made about it. It has two, uh, two books, which are in the back, full-length books, like real meaty books uh, about it. It's got dozens of articles over the past 60 years written about it. Um, and it just inspires so much <laughs> fandom. It's pretty, it's pretty great. Um, you have listened to me talk about Helvetica for 20 minutes, which means I think that you are probably more perfect than Helvetica. Um, that is Helvetica now. That's why we made it. That's who made it. Thank you. <laughs>